It stands for Wood Duck 40. And the traditional fly, of course, is tied using wood duck. Now, wood duck is one of those materials that you know people hear about and have seen. A lot of people don't really even know that it's pretty readily available. When I was a kid growing up back in the 60s and learning how to tie, what was more expensive? A jungle cock neck, wood duck feathers, or a grizzly neck? Who knows? It was actually the grizzly neck. The wood duck actually came second. The cheap thing was jungle cock, believe it or not. We couldn't get, this is in the days before um, Henry Hoffman, before Buck Metz, before Ted Hebert. This is before genetics for chickens took hold in the fly tying industry. And wood duck is one of those wonderful materials that we always had to buy and use mallard instead. It was just not as cool, but wood duck in and of itself is a really, really wonderful material. It's finer textured than mallard. The bars are contrast, are more contrasty. They have more sparkle and life to them. Um, they're not as got, don't have as much contract as say, a contrast as say um, a pintail or um, gadwall, uh, but they're really a really nice feather. And just using dyed mallard doesn't necessarily do it justice. I'm resetting a bobbin with some new thread. Hopefully we'll get farther along with this one. Now I'm going to be using two different materials tonight, and I'm going to do something very similar <coughs> To what we did with the last fly. Now normally the WD-40 is tied with a wood duck tail and like an olive or tan or whatever thread colored body you want and it is just thread and then a dubbing material and then you finish. But I'm going to do something just a touch different to show you how you can mix this up a little bit. So I'm going to grab some wood duck I've got two different materials here. I've got wood duck and I've also got something that's marked mallard flank, but in reality it's actually Egyptian goose. And I'm going to show you how we're going to use that in conjunction with the uh, wood duck. So I want some nice marked, in fact there's a very nice wood duck feather. I think, let's see if I can get this in front. You can see it's got some nice barring to it. It's really, really distinct and separate from the way that mallard looks when it's dyed. I'm going to make a nice short little tail, but I'm going to use a bunch of this material. In fact, sometimes, because I want to use this um, for the thorax, sometimes I'll put in more and then cut off some of the tail. But because we're going to do something different, I'm just going to put in enough for the tail. Very short, stubby little tail. This fly should be very, very lightly tied. Okay, I'm going to wind up a little bit and back down just to kind of smooth things out. And now I'm going to use, and you can use regular mallard for this if you'd like, I'm going to use Egyptian goose because it's a little bit stiffer and easier to work with uh, for what we're going to do here. <coughs> Come on. Wood duck is a really great material, but this is almost overkill when you try to use wood duck for what I'm going to use it right now. Now remember with the halo, we used the pheasant tail for the body material and actually wrapped it. Well, I'm going to do something similar here. I'm actually going to use this Egyptian goose, or you could, like I said, you could use dyed mallard. And I'm going to use that as a body material over the top. And since I've got this light colored thread down, I'm going to do the same routine I did before with the crystal flash, a couple of strands, use our easy tie-in method. I'm using a little bit more now because I'm going to actually use this as part of the wing case as well. The more crystal flash you use on the WD-40, the more it cements its position as being the top fly. The less you use on a halo, cements its position at being the bottom fly. The reason? Emergers tend to show more life and show more movement as they go vertically through the water column. The crystal flash in this particular case is giving these flies a sense of lifelike, a sense of living and being alive and moving and trying to break free of 
their exo the nymphal shuck and the, uh, the, the their, their nymphal case. It's their metamorphosis as they turn into winged adults. And the crystal flash really helps that along. So now I'm just going to kind of wide space the goose slash mallard and allow that crystal flash to show through. If you want to have a fly that's a little bit more durable, then you can use some crystal flash and use it as a rib. Now we've got it showing through. I'm going to save these butt ends along with everything else. And this is going to be my wing case. Now you can use whatever dubbing material you want. For whatever reasons, I forgot to bring the dubbing material out. So, rather than doing that, let's see. Oh, I know what I'll do. Perfect. I've got some uh, African goat up here. Traditionally, this material um, that you would use is actually a... Um, a lot of people like to use muskrat, even dyed muskrat. I love it. It's great stuff. And they leave the guard hairs in. This is a very small fly, so I'm not going to use a lot of this. In fact, I'll probably have to pull a lot of it off the uh, thread after I've wrapped it. But I do like it a little bit spiky, and this is a good material for that. Again, the colors just could be whatever you think you're going to want to use to match the hatch. That actually looks pretty good right there. I'm going to shove this back a little bit. If you ever crowd your headspace, don't hesitate. Use your fingernails, shove it back. Now I'm going to grab this and pull over the top. So it's sort of a combination flashback, um, wood duck, however you want to call it. There's crystal flash in that wing case, and it literally will help make this fly look more lifelike in the mind of the trout. Boy, it's a lot nicer to do a whip finish when you've got more thread to work with. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to get a little bit of these extra spikies out of the way. Now, I mentioned during the, the, the warm-up session that I really like to keep the number of tools I, I use down to a bare, bare minimum. Um, I have found over the time that I've spent more time looking for the tool that I want on the bench as opposed to actually tying. So, when I'm sitting here at the vise working, the tools that I have out are pretty straightforward. If you want to back out just a little bit, Zeno, just so you can get a clue as to what I've got going on here. I have my scissors, the best quality that you can get and afford and work with. Flat nose pliers. I like an angled bodkin. My father was a children's dentist. So I have a lot of his old tools when he passed away, and I dearly love them, not only from the sentimental standpoint, but also from the fact that hey, these things work really, really well. So something like this is great. Tweezers. Cotton, these are actually cotton pliers, angled point. They're really good for getting into your box and pulling out the um, hooks and whatever, or anything else that you need to pick up that's small. Nice pair of hackle pliers. The one thing I have found with hackle pliers is that I never like to have teeth that I can work with. Always try to keep the sides flat. You'll see that this is flat here. It's smooth. It's as smooth as a baby's bottom. And it's smooth all the way around this edge. There isn't a sharp point anywhere. And I literally spend the time with emery paper, the, like the back of wet dry paper, to make sure that it's like that. And about every two years, I replace the heat shrink tubing here so that it stays fresh and kind of soft. And what I do is when I put the heat shrink tubing on, I heat it up, let it shrink, and before it has a chance to cool, I go, I close each jaws on them, so that they actually fit each other very, very well. It's not about having teeth that grip. It's about having just a nice, smooth surface that will grab material and not cut it. That's what hackle pliers are for, grabbing, not cutting. The next tool I've got, or actually the last tool I have, is actually an old sur a surgeon's scalpel. This was my grandfather's. And it's tough to find something like this, obviously, but anytime you can use some sort of a long shank like this, it is not sharp. You can see I'm rubbing my fingers along the edge, but it is very stout. And when it comes time to wanting to <clears throat> pick out dubbing on flies 
especially larger flies with coarse material, like what we're going to do with the next fly, which is steelhead, these things are invaluable. They're much better than working with scissors. Skinny points like this, they just bend. This doesn't. It really does the job. And I think, actually, I lied. This is the last tool. Just an extra set of jaws that will handle larger hooks, which is what we're going to do in a second. So we've done the halo. We've seen it done the WD-40. Use these in combinations with two fly rigs, either conventionally weighted at top or the Czech style, European style, however you want to call it, with the weight down at the bottom and indicators. Both of them work really, really well. Okay, so there's those.